Shalom everyone, we're here to continue reading Nazarene Israel, the original faith of the apostles by Norman B. Willis. This will be the third recording as I'm reading several chapters in one reading. And obviously, if you don't have time to watch the whole thing or you're distracted or whatever, you might just pause it and come back to it. That's fine. But we want to record it in larger sections because not everybody wants to just hear five or ten minutes of material. They want to be able to get a bigger piece of the of the meat and, and chew on it a while. So you're obviously very welcome to pause it and come back to it. Um, and uh, let's just open in prayer. Father Yahuwah, we just thank you for this opportunity to come and sit before portions of your word that maybe we haven't heard exactly in the way that you intended for us to hear it. And we ask you to open our eyes that we can see, our ears that we can hear, our hearts that we can understand. We know that you are writing your word on our hearts, um, that we will obey your word. And so we ask you just to give us this understanding and the vision and, and the ears to hear, Father, so that we can walk in your will and be a part of your greatest will for our own lives. And we thank you for hearing our prayer and for bringing about the things we've asked. In Yahushua's name we pray, Amen. All right, we're just going to get right into the reading of this. And we're starting with a chapter called Establishing the Pattern. And if I look into my copy of this, I wonder if I can tell you what chapter it is real quick. So they're not exactly marked here. Uh, fifteen. We're on chapter 15, guys. You can get this book for a measly $7 at Amazon. And you can get the Kindle version for 99 cents. So there's like no excuse to not have this information. And, and if either of that is too much uh, or just not something you're interested in doing, it's all right here in front of you. We're reading the Kindle version. Here we go. Establishing the pattern. The ten tribes were banished from the land of Yashorel for sinning against their creator. That much is clear. However, if divine providence tells us that all things ultimately stem from the hand of the creator for a divine purpose, then what was that purpose? Why did the tribes have to sin and be banished? Is there any kind of a logical sequence or a pattern? In the beginning, Yahuwah formed the man Adam from the dust of the ground. And Yahuwah Elohim formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. That's Bereshit, which means in beginnings, or we know the book is Genesis 2, verse 7. Many Christians believe that Adam and Hawa, or we know her as Eve, could have avoided their fall from grace or favor rather the hebrew word really translates to favor simply by making better choices and yahuwah elohim said to the woman what is this you have done bereshit or genesis 3 13. but is that is that really so even though adam and hawa appeared to have free will and choice the apostle shaul who we know as paul tells us that our salvation was foreordained from before the foundations of the world just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be set apart and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Yahushua Mashiach to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the esteem of his favor, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. If salvation was foreordained, then surely it was also necessary for Adam and Hoa to fall so they could be saved. One wonders then if there might be a parallel with the house of Ephraim, and if so, what? And I want to remind you guys that there have been two other recordings, so this is um, not the best place to start the book. If, you have, if you're just joining us now, please go and watch the first and then the second video so you know where we're at here. It's a very, very important book. Many Christians believe that man will ultimately return to the Garden of Eden, from whence he came. This, however, is contrary to the scriptures, which tell us that mankind is headed for life in a city. 
Then I, Yao Kanan, saw the set-apart city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21, 2. This should be in your definition of a bride, is this city. It is called the bride in Revelation 21. If Dusty Man began in the field, but will ultimately progress to the city, can we infer that Yahuwah did not create Adam and Chawa as finished products? They may be finished in the physical material sense, but they still had to undergo a spiritual refinement. Like a rich metal ore, Dusty Man has to be crushed and then sluiced and then refined as silver and gold are refined in the fire and the furnace of affliction. But if mankind must undergo spiritual affliction, then what is the ultimate goal of all of his spiritual refinement and learning? Could it be to train this dusty, materialistic man to become more of a spiritual being? Or what is the purpose of it all? After Adam and Hawa, or Eve as we've known her, first broke his commandments, mankind began to be corrupt. This is from Bereshit, or Genesis 6, 11 and 12. The earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. So Elohim looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. At this time, Yahuwah told a man named Noach, or we have known him as Noah, that if he obeyed the voice of Elohim, he would save his own life and the lives of his immediate family. This is from Bereshit 6, 17 and 18, and we know it as Genesis. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Next, Abraham was asked to obey Yahuwah's voice. Even though it meant he would have to leave his home and his extended family and everything he knew and then sojourn in a land not his own. Bereshit, again this means in beginnings, Genesis 12.1. Now Yahuwah had said to Abram, Go yourself out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. This same Abraham later agreed even to slay his own son in obedience to Yahuwah's voice. Bereshit, or Genesis 22, 2. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Yitzhak, and we know him as Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Notice then that Noah obeyed Yahuwah's voice, but his reward was that he would save the lives of himself and his family members. In contrast, however, Abraham's obedience would cost him his relationships with his extended family, and later would even threaten to cost him his only son. What the scriptures reveal then is that Yahuwah continually raises the cost of being loyal to him. Whereas Noah, or we know him as Noah, would deliver his family through his obedience from Abraham on forward, such obedience would begin to take an increasing personal toll. This pattern of raising the cost of obedience then carries forward to the incident with the golden calf. Incidentally, the word calf is eagle. It sounds like eagle. We will listen more uh, in the in this reading today of what um, what the sound energies are all about. But the land that we are under, uh, that sound of, of the word calf in Hebrew is eagle or eagle, which sounds pretty close to me. When the children of Yasharel sinned against Yahuwah by making a visible object of worship, Yahuwah wanted to destroy Yasharel's children and make a new and superior nation out of Moshe's better seed. Moshe is the Hebrew name, and we have known it as Moses. It's, it's a, it's a Greek slash Latin slash English version. However, although Moshe would have personally gained just by consenting, he pleaded with Yahuwah to spare the lives of his Israelite brothers and sisters. And this is Shemot, which means names, um, and we know it as Exodus 32, 9 to 14. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. 
Now, therefore, let me alone, and that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moshe pleaded with Yahuwah, his Elohim, and said, Yahuwah, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yashareel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So Yahuwah relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Even though a man's carnal nature is to sire as many children as he can, Moshe sought to save his brothers and sisters' lives, even though it meant he would have to forego siring such a nation himself. Moshe then traded away his own personal success for an opportunity to serve others in a spiritual way. In this he was a shadow of the coming Mashiach, or Messiah, who laid down his life to save others. Yaokanan, or John, 15, 13 to 17, uh, well, I guess we're going to look at verse 13 first. Greater love has no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. What we see then is that the Israelite religion is not just a religion, but also a spiritual path. In contrast to the value systems of the world, Israelite worship asks one to learn to place others ahead of oneself. And we could also call this a, a Hebrew or Ebri is the Hebrew word, a, an Ebri worship or a Hebrew worship or a Yashorali worship. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Philippians 2, 3 to 4. The pattern then is that Yahuwah is training his dusty bride to nurture an ever-increasing devotion and love toward others. One must learn to do only good, even though it will cost one dearly in the material sense. One must learn not to rely on one's own might and power, but to turn to Yahuwah for support. One must learn to listen for the voice of the bridegroom and then obey it, no matter what personal cost one might have to incur. From Noach to Abraham to Moshe and then to the Mashiach, the material cost of obeying Yahuwah's voice would only increase. Despite ever-increasing personal sacrifice, the bride becomes both filled and adorned with love. By letting love be the central core motivation for every aspect of everything she does, this is true religion and this is the heart of the law. The Apostle Shaul, who we have known as Paul, addresses this beautifully in his writings at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of messengers, but have not love, I have become as a sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all belief so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of suffering and self-sacrifice in love. It suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, puts up with a lot, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. I submit to you, by the way, that as we learn, we, most of us grew up in churches and we, we learned in part. We have a part. And now there, there is something that is more perfect that has come to us here. And that's what we're trying to uh, examine here. We're examining the truth of the matter of what we're reading here. 
When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. And now abide, belief, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love truly is the greatest of all things, for we know that the Spirit is love. And this is from Yao Kana and Aleph, or 1 John 4, verse 8. And we've got 7 and 8 here. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of Elohim. And everyone who loves is born of Elohim and knows Elohim. He who does not love does not know Elohim, for Elohim is love. However, we are also told that without keeping the bridal instructions, the Torah, our love is not complete. This is Yah Kanan Aleph, or 1 John 2, 3 through 6. So he actually said this part first. Now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of Elohim is perfected in him. But this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And we know Yahushua kept the Torah. What Yahuwah is trying to fashion from his dusty lump of clay, then, is a bride who listens intently for the sound of his voice and who keeps his covenant in a heart of perfect love, no matter what it may cost her. However, Yahuwah knows that this that, that dusty old mankind is still a little dull around the edges and is only able to learn just so quickly. Therefore, he has been giving her everything she needs to grow in stages, as if he has been raising her up from her childhood. Up until this point in history, Christianity has not needed to know anything about the need to fulfill the marital covenant. As the Christians have been busily spreading their version of the good news outward and making disciples in all nations, however, now that Ephraim's exile is nearing its end, of which we will speak in the next chapter, which we will get to today, the Christians are finally beginning to realize that there is more to being a follower of the Messiah the Mashiach, than just loving him in a purely idealized intellectual sense. Rather, one must also learn to walk just as he walked and do as he did. How would a bride be able to walk with her bridegroom if she did not? Before mankind was able to accept the true good news, mankind was only able to accept the Christian variation. Fallen Adam, or Adam, was so far fallen that he was not ready to accept the whole truth. And while Christianity is not the end goal of the belief in Yahushua, let us give Christianity its due. While the Christians did persecute the Jews, and while they exterminated the Nazarenes, or the Nazarim, those that learned the commandments of of Yahushua directly, um, were directly with him as his apostles, these, and their descendants, these were the Nazarim, uh, While the Christians did persecute the Jews and while they exterminated the Nazarene, they also brought great advancements to the world. Even their religion of intellectual-only love wrought a dramatic civilizing effect upon all of man's prior corruptions. Apart from their barbarous acts against the Jews, the Christians, and even the Catholic Christians to some extent, helped bring civilization to the world. Obviously not very civilized prior to that. For example, they stopped pagan earth worshippers such as the Druids from sacrificing their children at human life sacrifice sites such as Stonehenge. How many of us have, have glamorized the uh, our, our perception of Stonehenge, right? And here we're told that these Druids uh, were sacrificing their children at these human life sacrifice uh, places such as Stonehenge. Uh, Jonathan was talking about meeting a druid at a local store here and her father was a Mormon preacher or or bishop they're called and here she was self-proclaiming herself as a druid just just horrid to think if, if she were to take on the fullness of that that this is what would be required uh, 
After Catholicism became the official religion of the Roman Empire, instead of burning their children to demons in bone fires or bonfires, that's where that word comes from. Oh, let's have a bonfire. The Roman citizens were now engaged to come inside of the Catholic churches where they could simply burn candles to their demons who had been turned into figurines and canonized by the Pope. Hence, the children lived, so their lives were saved. From a Torah perspective, Christianity was just one desolating abomination after another. However, from an objective point of view, the Christians and even the Catholic Christians brought a great deal of advancement and civilization to the world. They no longer were killing their children. Even though the Pope would claim to be Elohim's representative on earth, the world was made into a much better place than before. This is one reason Yahushua tells us. And Yaakonin answered him, saying, Rabbi, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Who does not follow us? And we stopped him because he does not follow us. But Yahushua said, Do not stop him, for there is no one who shall do a work of power in my name, yet be able to speak evil of me quickly. For he who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you are of Mashiach, he will by no means lose his reward. Though the Christians would persecute the Nazarenes unto death, or the Nazarim, the, even the Christians would have their reward, for Christianity needed its day in the sun that the promises to the patriarchs might be fulfilled. Some Christians would be truer to the principle of love than others would be, but Yahuwah would know the difference, and all would be held accountable for what they knew in the day of judgment. What about Grandma? Grandma will be held accountable for what she knew in the day of judgment. What about my brother? Your brother will be held accountable for what he knows and what he knew in the day of judgment. Christianity's day in the sun, however, is rapidly being brought to a close. As we will see in the following chapter, the prophecies tell us that Ephraim's long period of exile has reached its finishing point, and the time for the regathering is at hand. We'll go to the next chapter, which I believe we, our count will hold this to be the 16th. Fulfilling the prophecies. Incidentally, when, when you see the word Yeshua and I read the word Yehushua, that is because that is his name. Yeshua is a noun and it means salvation and deliverance, rescue. It can, it can mean a lot of different kinds of deliverance. It can mean, often it is, it is a meaning of Yahuwah delivering us from our enemies in, in a state of war. Or it could be him delivering us from severe poverty and, and hunger and famine. That could be that kind of a deliverance as well. Sometimes it is a human that is the deliverer and the, somebody that comes along maybe again to deliver in the case of war. Somebody comes along to bring in reinforcements and the war is won and that sort of thing. So Yeshua is a very amazing word and, and this is an understanding the Father's given me in, in that you can use the word Yeshua to the Jews today and they will receive it because to them it's a very common noun meaning a deliverance or a rescue. It could be any of those things that I mentioned. It could also be a, a Messiah, but in general, the Father is always trying to deliver his people. And the Christians accept Yeshua because they've been taught over the last few decades that it is the same thing as Jesus. So you can speak the word Yeshua to a Christian and to a Jew. It has great functionality for that purpose. However, Yehushua is another name and it sort of goes in line with what we're reading here that people are open to certain amounts of the truth, certain levels. There's layers of the truth to be revealed. It's not all revealed at the same time because they could not handle it all at the same time. If you want to know the Messiah's name, it is in the scriptures. It is in the Strong's Concordance under 3091, Yehushua. It is, the Father's name is 3068 in the Strong's Concordance. It is Yehua. 
Yeshua is another number. Uh, I don't have that one memorized. However, I did do this research for somebody who asked, what is the difference between Yeshua and Yehushua? Which one's in the codes? Well, they're both in the codes. And you can, you can say, uh, Ye Yehua can say, deliverance is my character. The same word for character and fame and renown is also the same word for name. Like what somebody's known by. That's what the meaning of it is. So you could say that deliverance is my name, Yeshua is my character, or you could say Yehushua is my name. They're both in there. They're both written just like that, both spellings. Okay, fulfilling the prophecies. Ezekiel, this is Yekezkel, uh, and this word has to do with uh, El is my strength, or the strength of El. Ezekiel was told to lie on his left side for 390 days, each day symbolizing a year that Ephraim was to remain in exile. Remember, Ephraim is, is like the mascot of all ten northern tribes. And the word north in Hebrew is Zephon, and it's the same word for hidden. So north means hidden. It's the same word, Zephon. Okay, Yekezkel, or Ezekiel 4, 4 and 5. Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Yashorael upon it. According to the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Yashorael, or Ephraim, the whole ten tribes. Israel was to remain in exile 390 years, but there was a catch. Leviticus, which is the real name of this book, is Wayikra, and he called Wayikra. Leviticus tells us that those who do not perform all his commandments after being punished will have their time of punishment multiplied sevenfold. And this here you see at the bottom of this quote, Wayikra, Leviticus 26, 14, uh, We've got 14, 15, 17, and 18 here. 16, 17, and 18. Okay, 14 to 18. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you even seven times more for your sins. If the Assyrians began invading around 734 before the Common Era, then 390 years later brought us to 344 before the Common Era. Ephraim apparently did not begin keeping all the commandments at that time, and therefore his punishment was multiplied out seven times more. This is not the only person who says this. I have seen it in multiple places. Eric Bissell's the first person I heard it from. Seven times 390 years of punishment is 2,730 years of punishment. This number is the same in, in all people that I've heard it from. However, uh, the ten northern tribes began coming out at one point, at 734 before the Common Era, and the last of their coming out was approximately 720 before the Common Era. So that gives us uh, about 2009, 2010 is, is the end of that punishment. But here he's going he's gonna to show some evidence for it, it being the fir at the first of when they left, adding 2,730 years to that. And that is certainly legitimate as well. But I think the greater awakening, most people can relate to it being 2009, 2010. That's certainly when I started waking up and, and actually came out of the church, the churches that I was, I had gone to in my lifetime. Okay, so therefore, 734 before the common era plus 2,730 years, uh, 2,730 more years brings us to 1996 of the Common Era, or we would know it as A.D. We're more familiar with A.D. as a general rule. If this calculation is correct, we should be able to see the nascent beginnings of an 
Ephraimite or Ephraim movement at this time. And this is, in fact, what we do see. While it was established a few decades prior to 1996, the Ephra Ephraimite movement began to flourish in and around the mid to late 1990s. This phenomenon can only be explained by scripture prophecy. Lest anyone say that the Ephraimite movement was devised by men rather than Yahuwah, there are other scriptural witnesses. One major one we will look at here is in the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea or Hosea speaks primarily of Ephraim. Therefore, speaking of the lost Ephraimites, Hosea prophesies. Hosea 6 verse 2, after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Kepha, or who we know as Peter, tells us not to forget that a prophetic day with Yahuwah is equal to a thousand years. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with Yahuwah one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. That's Kepha Bet, or Second Peter 3 verse 8. If a prophetic day is actually a thousand years, then the two prophetic days of Hosea 6-2 represent two thousand years. In context, then, Hosea 6-2 tells us that after 2,000 years, the Ephraimites would be raised up in the third day so that they might live in Yahuwah's sight. The only question is, when does the third day begin? The phrase, the third day, ought to give us a hint that this prophecy somehow relates to Yahushua. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. That's Marcus or Mark 9, verse 31. By definition, a Mashiach or a Messiah. Now, this is the definition of a Messiah. We need to really focus on this. He's going to mention it a couple times. What does a Messiah do? What is a Messiah? A Messiah is a divinely appointed leader who brings the lost and scattered of Israel back to the land of Israel and to the covenant. Yahushua is the only historical person who fulfills that role. Modern scholarship tells us that the Mashiach was actually born in or about four before the common era. 2,000 years after be, uh, four before the common era brings us to 1996 common era, which would be four years before 2000, right? Which is the same year that the Ephraimite and Nazarene Israel movements began to gain popularity. Okay, so there was a movement through the 1900s and it began to gain popularity around 1996. But was there a deeper meaning to the scattering of the Ephraimites? If divine providence tells us that everything happens by the hand of the Creator, then what was his purpose? Yahuwah made a number of prophetic promises to the patriarchs. For example, Abraham was told that all the families of the earth would be blessed in him, meaning in his descendants. Now Yahuwah had said to Abram, Go out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse the one despising you. And in you, meaning in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's Genesis 12, 3, or Bereshit in beginnings. Then Abraham was told that he would father not just one nation, but that he would father many nations. As for me, look, my covenant is with you, and you shall become a father of many nations, and I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly, and I shall make nations of you, and sovereigns shall come from you, and I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you in their generations, for, for an everlasting covenant, to be Elohim to you and to your seed after you. And I shall give to you all the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, or Canaan as we know it, and I shall be their Elohim. This is in Bereshit, or Genesis 17, 4 to 8. This is an everlasting covenant. Who are these many nations? The Muslim peoples also descend from Abraham, but these are not the people of the covenant, because the promise was specifically to come from Yitzhak, or Isaac. Then Elohim said, No, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yitzhak, or Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. 
He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Yitzhak, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time, at this set time next year. Bereshit, Genesis 17, 19 to 21. Ishmael also has an inheritance in that Ishmael was to become twelve princes, and indeed there are twelve Islamic nations. However, salvation is not of Ishmael, but of the Jews, meaning Yahushua. That's in Yahu Kanan or John 4, 22. And the promise was prophesied to come through Yitzhak and then through Yaakov or Yashareel. Genesis 35, 10 to 12 also tells us that Israel would father a nation and a company of nations. So this is Bereshit or Genesis 35, 9 to 12. Uh, actually, he starts in 10. I have to check these because he doesn't always get these correct. And Elohim said to him, Your name is Yaakov. Your name shall not be called Yaakov anymore, but Yashareel shall be your name. So he called his name Yashareel. And Elohim said to him, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Yitzhak I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. While there has been much genetic immigration and immigration, the Jews of today's time are essentially the direct prophetic descendants of the Jews of Yahushua's time. Therefore, when verse 11 speaks of a nation and a company of nations that descend from Yaakov, we can assume that the singular nation that is spoken of is the Jewish nation, but who is the company of nations? The Muslim nations do not qualify in that they descend from Ishmael and not Yashareel. Therefore, the only reasonable candidates are the Protestant Christian nations from whom the Ephraimites are now, not coincidentally, beginning to emerge. They're coming out. We've even seen that in the Brexit. Did we not? They no longer wanted to be a part of what was going on over there. They wanted to exit themselves. And Brexit, uh, Brit, British, Brit means covenant and Ish means man, covenant man. That's what British means. That's literally what it means in Hebrew. So a Brexit it has to do with that covenant coming out of that. Notice that this also makes sense. Despite Muslim claims to the contrary, the Christians are the only other people on planet Earth who worship the same Elohim and who read the same book. That there has been fighting between Judah and Ephraim is easily ascribed to the fighting that has always existed between the two houses since ancient times. Next in the dream of Jacob's ladder, we will start to see the prophecies that could only be fulfilled by the dispersing of the tribes. There are some very important aspects mentioned in this prophecy, which both Orthodox Jewish and Christian scholars miss. And we're going to read this here. And Jacob, or Jacob as we've known him, went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came on a place and stayed the night there, for the sun had gone. And he took stones of the place and placed them at his head. And he lay down in that place. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, its top reaching toward the heavens. And behold, the angels of Elohim were going up and down on it. And behold, Yahuwah stood above it and said, I am Yahuwah, the Elohim of your father Abraham, and the Elohim of Yitzhak. The land on which you are lying, I give it to you and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you, meaning Yasharel's descendants, shall spread to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you, meaning genetically, and in your seed, meaning Yahushua. And behold, I will be with you and will guard you in every place in which you may go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not forsake you until I have surely done all that I have spoken to you. That's Bereshit or Genesis 28, 10-15. Verse 14 is a very special verse, and there is a twofold promise contained within it. At Galatians 3.16, the apostle Shaul tells us that this word seed is singular, and that it refers to Yahushua. Galatians 3.16 Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one. 
and to your seed, who is the Messiah, the Mashiach. This is another one of those frequent instances where the Apostle Shaul's words have thrown so many Christians off track for so many years because it was not yet time for the truth to be revealed. In context, the dream of Jacob's ladder tells us that the whole world would be blessed in Yahushua. This is obviously true. All nations have benefited from the tremendous technological and industrial achievements that have been wrought by the Protestant Christian peoples. Many nations have also benefited from the numerous societal freedoms that were originally initiated in Protestant Christian society and which some say can only survive in a believing society. However, if we check the language carefully, we will see there are actually two blessings given in verse 14. In addition to being blessed in Yahushua, all the families of the earth were to be blessed in Yaakov or Yasharael. Taken at its strictest, at its strictest, most literal meaning, this means that all of the families of the earth would be blessed in that they would intermarry with Yasharael's descendants. This cannot possibly refer to Yahushua because Yahushua never had children. What the passage states then is that all the families of the earth would be hybridized with the literal seed of Yaakov, and that once all the families of the earth had literally become of Yasharalim stock or Israelite stock, then they would be subject to the promise. Once they were subject to the promise, they would have the option to receive salvation by favor. That word literally means favor. Through belief by accepting Yahushua as their Messiah. Many Christians find the genetic component to be a challenge in that Christianity has always focused exclusively upon the gift of grace through faith. This is Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For you are all sons of Elohim through belief in Messiah Yehushua. For as many of you as were baptized into Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, meaning a Hellenized Jew, somebody who's taken on Greek customs or Hellenic customs. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah, Yehushua. And if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Not understanding the role of the Messiah, the Christian misreads Galatians 3:26 to 29 as saying that just because one believes in Yehushua, that the genetic component is no longer important. Remember the word Yeshua here, as it's written here, it means salvation, deliverance, rescue. That is not what this passage actually says. Remembering that Shaul's letters can be confusing, what this passage actually says is that the Messiah came to bring the Yashorelim, or the Israelites, back to the promises, the covenant. In other words, he came for Abraham and Yashorel's descendants. The question then typically arises, why would the Messiah come only for those who were subject to the promises? It is because this is the very definition of a Messiah. We're going to go back and look at the definition of a Messiah. A divinely appointed leader who brings back the lost and scattered of the children of Yashorael. So the point was to, do, to scatter them and then to bring them back. Because by scattering them, they took the DNA of Yashorael or Yaakob all over the world. They scattered. And then the, we need a Messiah to bring us back. Christianity's definition is actually anti-Messiah. One who does away with the children of Yashorael in favor of those who were never heirs to the promise at all. This interpretation is entirely contrary to scripture. The next question that usually arises is one of utter astonishment. What if there were, was someone in the inward reaches of the Brazilian jungle who never received Jacob's genetics? Would he or she be able to graft into the covenant by grace through faith? The simple answer is that this question goes directly against scripture. We are told in multiple locations that every family, every nation, and every clan would be blessed in Abraham's seed through Jacob. Unless we are willing to call Yahuwah a liar, we must believe every word of his word. The detailed answer is that there are records of the Yasharalim or the Israelites being on both the North and South American continents since before the Babylonian exile around 586 
before the Common Era. Modern archaeologists have also replicated ancient Phoenician transatlantic voyages regarding uh, Thor Heyerdahl and the Ra 1 and 2 expeditions. And since the Israelites were also seafaring merchants, there is no reason to believe that they did not also number among those who crossed the Atlantic. Further, there were three major and many minor exiles in the nation of Yasharel's long history. The vast majority of the Israelites never returned from these exiles, and given the many thousands of years that these exiles had to merge, migrate, drift, and assimilate, it only seems reasonable that they had ample time to fulfill the letter of Yahuwah's word. When we remember that the ancient Israelites were also seafarers, Almost 3,000 years is plenty of time for the dispersed of Jacob to have spread to the four corners of the earth. To visualize how long such migrations might take, all we need to do is to imagine pouring three cups of chlorine bleach into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It might take some time for the chlorine bleach to disperse, but one can rest assured that it will. The Jews have been known to be at the center of world commerce in all ages. Scripture also records for us that Jewry had penetrated into the heart of Africa by or before the first century common era. For example, an Ethiopian Jew had come up for the pilgrimage. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. That's Maase or Acts 8, verse 27. We should remember that Ethiopia is fully one-third of the way to South Africa and that Nigeria is similarly distant. Remembering that the word Niger means black, there were also apparently a Nigerian Jew numbering among the prophets and teachers. This is from Maase Acts 13 verses 1 and 2. Now in the assembly that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Shimon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Shaul. However, despite the migrations of Israel's children, genetics is only a prerequisite to salvation. One is not saved by genetics, but by belief in Yahushua. Galatians 3.7 Therefore know that only those who are of belief are sons of Abraham. Judah and Ephraim were scattered to the four corners of the earth to be mixed with the children of every tribe and tongue and people. Once every family, every nation, and every clan was blessed with Yashorael's genetics, the whole world was now heir to the promise of salvation. At that point, it became only a question of who would decide to hear Yahushua's voice and heed it, and who would not. Yahushua tells us that his sheep will hear his voice and will rejoin their brothers, the Jews. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Yohanan, or John 10, 14-16 When his sheep hear his voice, calling them back to the land after two thousand years, it will fulfill other prophecies as well. For example, in Jeremiah or Yirmiyahu 31 verse 6, the word watchman in Hebrew is notzrim. This is also the Hebrew word for the Christians. For there shall be a day when the notzrim, the watchman or the Christians, on Mount Ephraim shall call out, Arise and let us go up to Mount Zion, to Yahuwah our Elohim. That's Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah 31 verse 6. The Two Houses in the New Covenant If we want to understand the references to the two houses in the New Covenant, or this is really the Renewed Covenant, it's, the word is renewed, Kodesh, then we need to understand Israel's three main exiles. Israel's first and greatest exile was the Assyrian diaspora in which Israel's ten northern tribes were taken away and sown into the earth like wheat seed. Indeed, the word diaspora means the seeding, the dispersion, you cast out seed. 
and the first fruits of the dispersed Ephraimites are only just now beginning to return. We've seen in the news that there are some of the tribe of Ephraim that are returning now to the land. The diaspora is also called the Great Dispersion. This Great Dispersion began in a series of invasions that took place from approximately 734 BCE until 722 BCE, which was that date, that earlier date I gave you, the, there's the earlier and the, the later date which would be 722 before the Common Era. And then 2,730 years added to the 734 gives you 1996 of the Common Era and in, in our lifetimes. And 722 plus 2,730 year curse gives us 2009, uh, 2010. However, while the dispersion mainly concerned the Ephraimites, the Assyrians, were not very particular about whom they took into captivity. When they came to take away the Ephraimites, they also took away a great many of Judah. This is why Jacob or James writes his epistle, not just to the ten tribes of the dispersion, but to the twelve. Jacob, a servant of Elohim and of the master Yehushua Messiah, to the twelve tribes who are in the dispersion. Greetings. That's Jacob, or the book that we know as James 1 verse 1. The term dispersion normally refers to the ten tribes of the northern house of Israel, or Ephraim. That Jacob addresses the twelve tribes instead of just the ten simply makes him more correct. Jacob, however, is not alone in addressing his lost Ephraimite brethren. The apostle Kepha, or Peter, also addresses the dispersion. Like how many of us missed this growing up in church? Kepha, an emissary of Yehushua Messiah to the chosen strangers of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, or Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Kepha Aleph, or 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. In his epi epistle, Kepha tells the Gentiles that they are not Gentiles as one thinks of Gentiles in the West. Rather, he calls them an elect race and a set-apart nation, something that Gentiles in the Western sense of the word never were. Not only that, but he quotes Hosea to tell them they are actually the restored house of Ephraim being called back to the covenant. But you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a set-apart nation, and a people for a possession, so that you may openly speak of the virtues of the one who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You who were then not a people, lo, ami, but now are the people of Elohim, Hosea 1.10, the one not pitied then, lo Ruhama, Hosea 1.8, but now pitied, Ruhama, Hosea 1.10. Kepha, this is in Kepha Aleph, or 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Kepha calls the Gentiles Ami, which means my people. Am would be my, and Ami would be my people. I'm sorry, Am would be people. Pardon me. Am is people, and Ami is my people. And Ruhama is pitied. This is because while Ephraim was once not a people, lo ami, lo means not or no, lo ami, they are once again the sons of the living Elohim in fulfillment of Hosea 1.10. The apostle Shaul also quotes Hosea to show the Gentiles that they are actually the Ephraimites. So apostle Shaul is is telling them what we today are telling you. You are actually Ephraimites. You're actually of the 10 Northern tribes. If you love the creator and you love the Messiah, you are Ephraimites. You are of the 10 Northern tribes. That doesn't mean you're necessarily of the tribe of Ephraim, but you're, you're called an Ephraimite because all 10 tribes were called the house of Ephraim and they were called the house of Israel or the house of Yashorel. Okay, so we're telling you right now what Shaul was telling them then. We are not against Apostle Shaul or Apostle Paul. We're telling you what he was telling them. It says it right here. The Apostle Shaul also quotes Hosea to show the Gentiles that they are actually the Ephraimites. We're doing the exact same thing. We're doing the exact same thing the Messiah was doing. We're calling the lost sheep of Israel. We're not calling anybody that doesn't want to come. 
We're calling those who want to come, come out of all the mixtures and come back to a pure belief and obedience to the Father. This is in Romans or Romim 9, 24 to 26. Whom he also called, not only for us Jews, but also out of the nations, meaning Ephraim. And that word nations would be Gentiles. And also he says in Hosea, I will call them who were once not my people, lo ami, my people. And them who were once not having been loved, lo ruhama, love, beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, lo ami, there they will be called sons of the living Elohim. Shaul quotes Hosea to tell the returning Gentiles that they are not Gentiles without a past, but that they are actually the lost sheep of the house of Yashareel or Ephraim. Then he tries to tell them that their Jewish brethren have not been cast away forever. Romim or Romans 11, 1 and 2. I say then, has Elohim cast away his people forever? Elohim forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Elohim has not cast away his people whom he forever knew, he foreknew. What we see is a repeat of the same pattern that had taken place earlier in Jeroboam's time. Israel was to become the new lead house while the Jews would be afflicted, but not forever. So this was at the time that the tribes were separated between the two southern tribes and the ten northern tribes. Melachim, or all of 1 Kings 11.39 says, And I will afflict the descendants of David, or David as we know him, for instance the Jews, because of this, but not forever. However, while the Jews would be afflicted, Shaul tries to make it clear that this affliction would not be permanent. Romim, or Romans 11.11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. Shaul tells Ephraim that Judah, or Yehuda will be grafted back into her own root. She will accept Yehushua as soon as Ephraim has spread the good news to the ends of the earth. This is Romim, or Romans 11, 25 to 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this secret, lest you should be wise in your own estimation, that blindness in part has ha happened to Israel, meaning both houses here, until the fullness of the Gentiles, or Ephraim, has come in. And, all, and so all Israel, meaning both houses, shall be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away iniquity from Yaakov. That's quoting Isaiah 59.20. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins, quoting Isaiah 27.9. So um, Shaul, and we know him as Paul, he's quoting uh, what we would call, what we've been taught to call the Old Testament, but is the First Testament. It is the Tanakh. Both houses were to be blinded for a time. That's what that scripture just said that we just read. Both houses were to be blinded for a time. Ephraim would know Yehushua, who we'd known as Jesus, but would not know the Torah. This would allow them to carry the good news to the ends of the earth much faster than the Nazarene would have been able to spread it. Judah, or Yehuda, conversely, would be blind to Yehushua because they were to remain focused on the Torah, which is called the Everlasting Covenant, so that Ephraim would have an inheritance to return to. The big secret, then, is that the two houses were given two different tracks. Yehua placed the Ephraimites on the Christian track, which meant that they would have belief in Yehushua, which they knew as Jesus, but they would be blind to the need for the covenant. While this would be entirely their fault, Yehua would also make use of it for good. Judah, or Yehuda, conversely, would try to keep the Torah, but because they would be blind to Yehushua, they would never be able to experience the true fullness of it. However, Shaul tells us that Yehuda would ultimately be recovered to the covenant, because their blessing and election as children of the covenant was irrevocable. 
Romim or Romans 11, 11 to 29. Uh, we're, it looks like we're just reading 28 and 29 here. Concerning the good news, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of Elohim are irrevocable. How about that? The gifts and the calling of Elohim are irrevocable. Once he's called you, he's called you. And your gifts are there too. However, neither the Christian nor the Orthodox track would be in, would be sufficient to gain one entrance into the kingdom. The people, Satan or Satan, as we've known him, which means adversary, the people the adversary is really out to get are those who both have the testimony of Yahushua and keep the necessary commandments. And this is in uh, Re Revelation, uh, which is the word kazon or visions. And the dragon, this revelation, uh, 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yehushua Messiah. That's the manifestation or kazon or revelation 12, 17. The prophets also speak to the need to both keep the Torah and to believe on Yehushua. And by the way, before I get to the prophets and, and going on, in the in the book here i would also say besides looking at revelation 12 17 in your restored name scriptures which you can see on online you can see at biblehub.com just pick the isr translation you need a restored name translation to understand truth because the name of yahuwah is the key walking in the name of yahuwah is the key to restoration to the he says in, in Yermiyahu 33, 1 to 3, he says to call on me and I will show you the greatness and the unknowns. And by the way, the unknowns are the things that were made inaccessible in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel incident. So he will return that information that was kept hidden from them. He will return to those who call on his name in spirit and in truth and only on his name and, and, and remove the the mixtures, the pagan names that we've, we, that we grew up with in our scriptures. So when you get into your restored name scriptures, which you can access online for free in a restored name, King James version, there's a free one. And you can also read it in an ISR, which is Institute for Scripture Research at biblehub.com. You can also order a hallelujah scriptures. You can also order a Sefer scriptures. Uh, with a, you can, you can use a code, a coupon code of code searcher and get 10% off of the Sefer. And, uh, with the hallelujah scriptures, when you order your scriptures, you're helping others around the world to get a free copy. Uh, those that are truly in poverty. And so in this way, you can help sow the seed of restoring truth around the world. So I highly recommend for you to do that as well. Um, okay. So in your restored name translation, look up Revelation 12, 17, look up Revelation 14, 12, and look up Revelation 22, 14, and you will find out how important these commandments are. First John also talks about the importance of keeping the commandments. Um, Yahuwah, Yahushua also talks about the importance of keeping the commandments and nothing would pass away uh, from his coming. Nothing's, nothing of the Torah is going to pass away. We're going to read on about that. I also want to mention in your restored name scriptures, read in Isaiah 8, 14, and it will talk about he will be a sanctuary, but he will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses. And we're talking about the two houses here. So, and we're reading about it as well. The house of Yehuda stumbled over the Messiah, uh, not seeing him and thinking the Torah was all they needed. And the house of Ephraim, which was coming right out of the Protestant churches, they stumbled over the Messiah, believing that he did away with the Torah and that they don't have to keep the Torah. It's both and. We need to keep the commandments of Yahuwah because what kind of bride would we be if we didn't keep the commandments that are our groom set for us and would just be make us a, a, a spiritual adulterer and we need to have the testimony of Yahushua as well so we need both those things whichever of the 12 tribes we're in so we're going to keep reading now but I'm just giving you some extra stuff here 
reiterating some some extra scriptures here that you can do the research on the the research is abundantly available to you it's abundantly available if you're not looking into these things there's something in you that doesn't want to know the truth doesn't want the restoration doesn't want the hidden information that is is becoming very very available you just have to have the heart that wants to know it it's out there it's it's very available and there are many people that you who was already brought out of the deceptions and the delusions and the half truths that can help you find the way you can certainly ask Jonathan or me. You can email us, Jonathan at thecodesearcher.com, Darla at thecodesearcher.com. We have 12tribesebri.com, which is a brand new, our sister website, where we're putting this information and all the things, everything the enemy could take away from you and remove from you and your ancestors so you would not know it, he has done. And that's why in Yermiyahu or Jeremiah, which means the exaltation of Yahuwah, Yermiyahu 16, 19 to 21, it says, In the day of distress, the Gentiles will come to you and say, that means there will be a day of distress for the Gentiles. There's no reason to pray it away. It will be there. A day of distress for the Gentiles. When that day gets here, when that day gets here, the Gentiles will come to Yahuwah and say, Surely our fathers inherited only falsehood and futility in which there is no assent. And then it says, shall a man make Elohim or mighty ones where there are no Elohim or mighty ones? And then it says that in that day, they will know my hand and my might, and they will know that my name is Yahuwah. Okay, so it's very, very important. This is also the same chapter, one of the main chapters that talks about a second exodus. If you didn't learn about the second exodus, somebody wasn't teaching you something that they needed to be teaching you. And basically the thing is, is that the way it is explained even in this book is that there was a reason that we didn't have all of the information we needed. But we also know that we're commanded to study to show ourselves ourselves approved. So uh, we, we all have to get to studying and we all have to restore. There's another scripture in uh, Isaiah or Yasha Yahu, and that means the salvation of Yahuwah. And it's in 4222, and, and it says, My people are locked up in prison houses, and they've been robbed and plundered, and but no one says restore. Well, we're saying restore. We're calling for restoration. That's what 12 Tribes Ebri, our, our site there, is all about. It's about restoration. We're um, we're teaching our apprentices in code searching. It's about serving Yahuwah and his people, and that ministry is about restoration. We're sharing the the hidden secret things of Yahuwah for a purpose. It's to serve Him and His His whole ministry of restoration right now. So um, we're we're encouraging you in this day and age. There is no very good excuse anybody's going to have for not searching out the truth of the matter of everything we're sharing. If you're listening to us. And, and this is the message and the ministry and the drive Yahuwah is compelling us to do, which is to restore, restore, restore to his people, his name, his son's name, his Torah, his calendar, his Shabbat, uh, his people, the 12 tribes, that they're going back to the land, that there's a second exodus, his pure language. I know I'm forgetting a few things in here, but I know there's like, I've got 15 when I sit down and write them out and think about them. There are his feasts, not the feasts that we grew up with, not the holidays that we grew up with, but his feasts, they're all in Wayikra and he called or Leviticus. So point being is that there is an abundance of information available to you. There's an abundance of people that have been called out and have already gone through these steps since 2009. There's no reason or excuse, justifiable excuse, to be sitting in the dark. Once you hear it, once you hear it here, you become responsible to search out the truth of the matter and then to walk in it. All right, let's keep going. The prophets also speak to the need to both keep and keep the Torah and to believe on Yahushua. So this is in Yahshayahu, which I just told you means the salvation of Yahua, or Isaiah, as we've learned the book to be called, 8 verse 20. This is in that same chapter I just told you about. He shall become a stone of offense. And a, a, let's see, how does it say? And he shall be a sanctuary, a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling to both the houses. 
Okay, so this is in that same chapter. So important. Get you a restored name scriptures and read it. Read the word. To the Torah and to the testimony of Yahushua, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Yahushua is the bridegroom and the Torah is a record of his instructions. Until we both believe on him and keep his instructions, our worship of him is far from complete. The worship of the two houses then is curious. Ephraim is like a woman who insists she loves her husband, but does not want to do what he asks. Conversely, Yehuda or Judah more or less does what Yehushua asks, but she uses her partial obedience to her to his instructions as an excuse to lock him out of her house. Both of these expect to be taken in marriage. There are other references to the two houses hidden in the renewed covenant. Okay, so here's another piece. Everybody that Yahuwah has called out and he's given them a ministry or an area, it's like he's given them pieces of a big puzzle. Like they all have the same puzzle. In fact, I have an article on um, on the 12 tribes of Ebri. I don't remember if I put it on the, the codesearcher.com, but I definitely have it on the 12 tribes of Ebri. Go look for it there. It's about, it's a, it's an image of, of a puzzle. It's a, it's a modern day parable about people working on, um, a couple of three different kinds of puzzle. Okay. And then there's the pure puzzle and, uh, people were working on this puzzle. Everybody has different pieces of the puzzle they're working on. And then they're, they're sharing their puzzle pieces. So, so they're saying, okay, well, I put this section together and I put this section together and people will be working on their own puzzle and their own puzzle pieces. It's all the same puzzle at the pure puzzle table. But, uh, sometimes people don't want to go and see what somebody else has got worked out, but they've had a piece of the truth given to them and somebody else has had a piece of the truth given to them. And in the end, it's all the same thing. So it behooves us to look at what other people have. It absolutely does. Okay. So one of the pieces that has been already worked out is that this is not a new covenant. It's a renewed covenant. That means it was already a covenant, but it has like a, a renewed face to it. It's, it's got a newness to it. It's been made new, but it's still the old covenant. Okay. So that's one of the pieces. Um, another piece is the Shabbat. Uh, some people have really been given some expertise and revelation on the real Shabbat of Yahuwah. Well, he didn't, he didn't come along and say, well, you know what? I love that Gregorian pagan pap papal calendar. I'm going to use that one now. And we're just going to call Saturday. It's been Saturday since the very beginning. I'm just going to go back to the beginning and say, okay, we got Sunday to Saturday. That's not the way it works. It's not the way it does work or that it did work. Saturday used to be the first day of the week. That would, would make what? Friday, the seventh day. Well, no, Yahuwah doesn't use the calendar that the Gregorians use. He has his own calendar. And the, the appointments with Yahuwah are, are based on that calendar. And he called the sun and the moon and the stars to be involved with the signs. And the word seasons is, is mistranslated. It's actually Moedim or the appointments. So there's signs up there in the, in the heavens where we can't, as men, as, as men in high places, those men, they cannot uh, disturb the calendar of Yahuwah. They cannot afflict the things of, that Yahuwah has planned for us. His calendar is in the heavens. Okay, so that is another piece that some people have been given a special perspective to work out that pure puzzle. And it behooves us to go and see, did this person get it right? Or did this person over there, they think they got it right. Did they get it right? Okay. Now the, the Gregorian calendar, that's not even at the pure truth puzzle table. That's at another puzzle table altogether. It's in a marred puzzle table that they're working on a different puzzle. It's not Yahuwah's puzzle table. So we're talking about the people that are putting these pieces back together from the beginning. His word says to ask for the ancient past where the good way is. So we need to go back in the word and pick up where, how do we work out this pure puzzle at the pure puzzle table. Many have been given some perspective on how to put a, their part together. So we need to go see what they're putting together. Eric Bissell is working on the pure paleo Hebrew, Hebrew, the pure language. 
Uh, Alan Horvath is working on the pure language puzzle. We need to go observe those. Now it may be, now I'm just going to give it as an example. It may be that Eric Bissell is working on his puzzle and he's not looking at what Alan Horvath's working on. So they're not sharing information, if that is the case. I'm not, I don't know for sure. I'm just giving an example on, say, the, the pure language. They're both working on their puzzle. They may or may not be looking at what each other's doing. It would behoove them to look at what each other's doing, but maybe their focus is just on what they're doing, and maybe that's the way the Father wants it right now. But we, not being experts in those things, we can look at what they're both doing, and we can benefit, and we can build our puzzle benefiting from what both of those people are doing. Troy Miller's been given a perspective on the calendar at creationcalendar.com. We want to go examine what he's doing. We want to see why what other somebody else is doing is not quite right. World's Last Chance, they work very closely with what um, Creation Calendar is doing on the, on the calendar. They have repented from uh, worshiping on Saturdays because they examine the, the evidence for a lunar based calendar, a solar lunar calendar, and the, and the Shabbat is based on the lunar cycles every month. Um, it, it rolls around and we, in our, in our Shabbats follow the moon as it says in Psalm 104, 19. It says the moon is made for the Moedim. Okay. The appointments with Yahuwah. Okay. So anyway. That, uh, that that became a place here where I saw the New Covenant too, to basically talk about different things that have been restored and renewed and are in the process of being renewed. Everything that could have been marred and seeing through a dimly lit glass of, of like mud and stuff now or a mirror a, 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 where the silver has become tarnished in the mirror and so it's, it's dimly seen. Now we're starting to see a more perfect perspective of what the Father has done and what he is doing. So I will just tell you that this word that is translated to new covenant is actually the word renewed. You All you have to do is go and look in your Strong's Concordance and look up these words and see what they mean. Okay. There, there are other references to the two houses hidden in the new covenant or renewed covenant. However, because the language is symbolic, most Christians do not recognize them for what they are. More than a hundred years after the lost 10 tribes were taken away in the Assyrian diaspora or dispersion or scattering, the Jews of the southern kingdom were carried away in an exile of their own. This second Jewish exile became known as the exile to Babylon. The Babylonian exile lasted approximately 70 years. At the end of that time, roughly 10%, 10% of the Jews came back to the land in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah or Nehemiah. The other 90% of the Jews remained out in Babylon where living conditions were easier. Like the Ephraimites, they are in, they also intermarried. and ultimately assimilated into the surrounding culture. Then, as a result of military conquests, commercial trading, and the like, Judah's seed also spread to the four directions, just like the chlorine bleach in our earlier example. Because of this, Kepha likened their calling to that of their Ephraimite brothers. Okay, so 10% came back, 90% of that DNA stayed in Babylon and went out from there. She who is in Babylon meaning the 90% of Judah still out in the Babylonian exile, chosen together with you, meaning the lost 10 tribes still in the diaspora or dispersion, greets you. Also my son, meaning his disciple, Mark, Kepha, Aleph, or 1 Peter 5, 13. Kepha is not alone in writing and symbolism. In his second epistle, Yaokanan, or John, uses Leah and Ra Raquel, as symbols of their respective children. We know them as Leah and, and Rachel, but they're Leah and Raquel. And their respective children, Judah and Yosef, these two sons all are also, are after all symbolic of the two houses. So we have Judah and Yosef, or Yehuda and Yosef. There is no J in Hebrew, okay? So that's why I, I read the names as, as they are, as they sound in the sound bites. 
Yao Khan and Bet or Second John 1 1, the elder brother, meaning the house of Yehuda, to a chosen lady, Raquel, and her children, meaning the house of Yosef or Ephraim, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also those who have not who but also those who have known the truth. Remembering that Yaukanan, John, was Jewish, and that Yehuda was born to Leah, we read, the children, meaning the house of Yehuda, of your chosen sister Leah, greet you. Amen. That's Yaukanan Bet, or Second John 1, 13. Yehushua also gives us a prophecy about the return of the lost Ephraimites in the parable of the prodigal son. This is very important, guys. Try to, try to, like, hone into this. The church has always taught that this parable is nothing more than a beautiful story about a backslidden sinner who repents of his sin and turns back to Yahuwah. However, when we understand the two houses, we see that it is much more. Remembering that the name Ephraim literally means prodigious and that Yehuda is older than Ephraim, let us try to understand this parable as a prophetic picture of the Protestant Reformation and the return of the lost ten tribes. The certain man in the parable is Yehuah. And Yehushua said, a certain man, Yehua, had two sons. And the younger of them, Ephraim, said to the father, Father, give me that part of the goods falling to me. And he divided the inheritance between them. And not too many days after, gathering up all things, the younger son, Ephraim, went away to a distant country in the Assyrian dispersion. That's when he left. And there he wasted his goods the law, and the language. He lost the Torah and he lost the pure language, living dissolutely and becoming a lawless Gentile. But having lost all his goods, a severe famine, meaning a famine of spiritual food, prophesied in Amos 8.11, came through that country and he began to be in need. And going, he was joined to one of the citizens of that country, referring to the Pope. That's what it was referring to. And he sent him into his fields to feed the pigs, or the idols. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything that would sustain him spiritually. But coming to himself in the Protestant Reformation, he said, How many of my father's servants have plenty of loaves, as bread is symbolic of the Torah? But I am perishing with famine. Rise up, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and against you, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please make me as one of your hired servants. That's Luke 15. Obviously, there are there are parts put in here. He's, he's filled in in parentheses what he believes these are terms to these this analogy to re refer to but you can literally just read Luke 15 and see this parable and understand that this is the two brothers are the house of Ephraim and then the house of Yehuda as we will show in the study migrations that's another book that he's written the lost ten tribes did, did disperse to all four directions fulfilling the dream of Jacob's ladder. However, the bulk of Ephraim moved north and west by three separate migration routes. These three separate migration routes ultimately converged in what later became known as Protestant Northern, uh, Northwestern Europe. Okay, before I go on, I want to say here that uh, Norman Willis believes that Ephraim settled in the United States. This is in contrast to what several of the other Hebrew people, Christian people have studied and have found that it is quite the opposite, that Ephraim ended in, in the land of England and all of her territories where she went out and became a dynasty and, and conquered and was a great leader of those places. And that would include part of Canada, that would include Australia, that would include New Zealand. Um, and many of the of the territories in the Caribbean and I believe Belize belonged to England for a long time. And then many of these smaller countries ended up gaining their independence from Egypt uh, from England. 
Uh, however, they were, they were much better off under England. And Stephen M. Collins had a book that we read online, the, just the last chapter, just the, the chapter, it's called Israel's Tribes Today is the book. We read the last final chapter. We sort of cheated and went to the end of the book because we never know how long we have. So we wanted to sort of cut to the chase. There's three or four books of intense research that Stephen M. Collins did, and I think even quite a bit of it is available on YouTube videos. Um, but he shows very good evidence, I believe, as to why Ephraim is in England and Menashe is in the United States. But Norman Willis believes it to be the opposite. That's why I say it's important to see what the puzzle pieces are being put together around the table, the puzzle table, the pure puzzle table, and see which one you think fits better after doing the research. For, for us, we're holding on to Stephen M. Collins' version, but this is an alternate version. If we're wrong, then, then that would be, that would be the way to, to try to look at that work and, and see which fits better. I'm not sure that Norman Willis is the only one that believes that Ephraim is in the United States. Um, but for right now, we are holding that Ephraim is in England and all of her territories that she has settled and, and taken and that Menashe is in the United States. So we're about to read some of that. Just realize that from our perspective that uh, Menashe is in the United States, and we, we're going by what Stephen M. Collins says here. Okay, after the Ephraimites in northwestern Europe threw off the Dark Ages of Catholicism, some 1260 years after they were given into the Little Horn's hand, they began to seek Yahuwah more directly. As a result of this, Yahuwah blessed their entire culture with prosperity and technical achievement that had never been known by man. And rising up in the Protestant Reformation, he came to his father, but he yet, being far away from the original Nazarene belief and the Torah, his father saw him and was moved with pity and running. He fell on his neck and fervently kissed him, though he was still as yet only a Protestant Christian. And the son Ephraim said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and no longer am worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Bring out the best robe and clothe him. Literally, this is Joseph's coat of many colors. And give a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet and bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine, Ephraim, was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. In the parable, the father saw Ephraim a long ways off, ran to him, fell on his neck and kissed him. This is symbolic of how Yahuwah has blessed the Protestant nations beyond all others, simply for seeking his face. This, of course, is a source of frustration and resentment for Yehuda, who has kept the Torah for millennia without ever having received the same kinds of blessings of safety and easy po prosperity. Luke 15 goes on to say, with these emphases added, But his older son, Yehuda, was in the field and coming. As he drew near to the house, for instance, the temple, he heard music and dances, and having called one of the children to him, Yehuda inquired as to what this might be, and he said to him, Your brother Ephraim came, and your father killed the fattened calf, because he received him back in health. But Yehuda was enraged and did not desire to go in. Then coming out, his father begged him. And that's Luke 15. Notice that Yehuda's indignation at Ephraim's being welcomed back to the land of Israel, in spite of having previously despised the covenant like Esau did, but answering, he, Yehuda, said to the father, Behold, how many years have I served you, and never did I transgress a commandment of yours, but you never gave me a young goat, so that I might rejoice with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he does not even call Ephraim his brother, the one having devoured your love, livelihood with harlots, idols, icons, false religions, traditions, false feast dates, false feast sites, etc., you kill the fattened calf for him. And of course, I told you what the calf is. It's eagle. So 
But he said to him, Child, you are always with me, and all of my things are yours. But to be merry and to rejoice was right, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. That's in Luca, or Luke as we've known it, fifteen twenty-nine to 31. Understand Yehuda's incredulity. He had been faithful to the Torah for thousands of years and has even suffered persecution at his brother's hand in the many massacres, pogroms, inquisitions, and Christian crusades. His brother Ephraim walked away from the covenant, worshipped golden calves, or the eagle, and tried to change the Torah, and yet the father still orders his servants, bring out the best robe, meaning Yosef's multicolored coat, give him a signet ring, and bring sandals for his feet, as only slaves went barefoot. Yehuda is furious and aghast at all this. How can such an injustice possibly be? The key to understanding this unimaginable turn of events is to understand the allusion to Yosef's many-colored coat and all that it signifies. And let me just stop here real quick and say, uh, Yehuda lost a lot of information too. Everything that could have been hidden was hidden. Lamentations 2 6 tells us that they lost the Shabbat. Okay? And we know that they lost many years. That's common if you do any research. They lost many years, so they don't exactly know what year it is. But I do believe in the codes that the Father is aware of that and He is He is uh giving us the year that they regard so that they can see Him and they can get closer, they can draw closer to the Father. Uh we believe that they lost the Feast of Weeks. Um, they certainly have done nothing to keep the name in. They have made his name, a, they've brought it to naught. They've made it vain emptiness, which is what the Ten Commandments said not to do. They call upon God, and in the Strong's Concordance, this is the Babylonian deity of fortune, Strong's H1408 and H1409. And if you'll read in your restored name scriptures in Isaiah 6511, Yahuwah is very wroth saying that they are they have set a table for god okay god was a was a chaldean babylonian deity of fortune okay so yehuda who was keeping the torah but they they lost his name and his name is the key to everything his name is the key to everything and we're returning we have an opportunity now and we are returning every person should go back and see if what they were taught was the truth. Fortunately, we have the right book, but we have a translation that has wrong deities' names in it, so we have to get beyond the translation. That's why Jonathan talks to people about getting back to the root. We have to get before the Catholic Church came in, okay? Because the Catholic Church, it, it, just, it just poisoned the waters from there on out, and all the Protestant churches are still just a reaction to the Catholic Church. So there's, we have to get before the Catholic Church. We have to get to the, what we're doing in this book, the original faith of the apostles. Okay. In scripture, <clears throat> let me grab a quick drink here. We know that this is a lot to take in, but the Father's been pouring this out at least since 2009. So many have come out. You likely know many who have come out and who are resonating with what we're telling you here. This is what they believe. A version of this is the puzzle parts they are personally putting together. It has been poured out. It is searchable. Okay. The key to understanding this unimaginable turn of events is to understand the allusion to Yosef's many-colored coat and all that it signifies. In scripture, it is sometimes used that the, it is sometimes said rather, that the end is known from the beginning. In the book of Genesis then, or Bereshit, Yosef was sold into slavery due to no fault of his own and was subsequently sent to prison for a crime he did not commit. This is symbolic of how the Nazarenes were driven from the synagogues and from the temple in punishment for believing on Yehushua, which is the very farthest thing from a crime. Yosef served Pharaoh honorably, and his Elohim-given abilities brought him great power and prestige. He was eventually able to use his position to save the lives of many people, including his father and his brothers. This can be seen as symbolic of the fact 
that the Christians are essentially the number two power in America and how they have even threatened to turn out of office any president who does not support their Jewish brothers in the state of Israel. It might also be noted that separation from one's own people, consecration in some versions, is highly regarded in scripture and it always carries a huge blessing. The reason for this is simple. Yahuwah created man as a social animal. It was not good for the man to be alone, Genesis 2.18. However, there are some circumstances in which men must be separated from their brothers and even from normal life in order to serve Yahuwah better. In the language of scripture, these individuals are thought to be set apart from the world, which is the actual meaning of the word holy or kadosh. Kadosh is the actual word. In, in, our, in our world here, at, at our farm here, um, I, I've left my family and my family is 10 hours away from me and it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And when I, I have seven children uh, that, that have come out of my body and I have the four youngest ones here and the three oldest are in California with the family that we left because it is very difficult to move a child once they're are like a preteen. It's very difficult. It's in them, what, they, what they've what they lived with, the society they've been a part of. They want to stay there. They're knitted into that society. It is very difficult to pull them out. And it just breaks my heart sometimes. Sometimes I miss my family so bad. I am crying over it. I miss my mother. I miss my sisters. I miss my children. I miss my nephew and niece. I miss my friends that I used to work with. I miss the career that I used to work in at times. Not very, not very often anymore. It's, it's starting to break away from me. Jonathan has had the same sort of situation where he's, he's moved away from his family of origin. He's moved away from his children, not by his design, not by his design at all, but the, the enemy through certain factions has cast him away from his children and and we hurt we hurt over it uh jonathan has trouble he was telling me the other day just walking into a walmart and, and he'll see his he'll see a father with his children or a mother with his children uh the other day we went and got a got a burger and he was seeing children swinging and their parents pushing him it's painful it is extraordinarily painful and in some ways, we, we believe that this is just this has just happened uh, for Yahuwah's purposes. Very much like what happened to Yosef. His, his siblings sold him into slavery in, in Egypt, uh, or that's where he ended up, rather. Um, the Midianite salespeople sold him there in Egypt. Um, it's very painful to be called out at that level. So it is, it's very reassuring and comforting to know that that it is for the greater good. We don't always see it yet, but we know it's for the greater good. And we pray for our children to be returned to us. I was praying, I think it was last night, I was praying, Father, when are you returning the children's hearts to their fathers and the father's hearts to their children? And that's not necessarily just children and, and parents, but it, it has to do with those keeping Torah uh, being being reconcile with those not keeping Torah and we we long for it we long for it certainly we know you do too those of you who are, are, are feeling that your level of belief and understanding the things you who is calling you to and the ways that he's separating you from your family we hear it from many so we know it's not just us uh we understand the pain, the level of pain there. We, we understand it at a personal, very personal level. And I personally believe the fathers put a prophet in each family in the sense of someone to call their family out to the truth. And, and the word says that in the day of distress is when they're going to turn. So just know that the father is preparing you for a time in the future and there are many that you you will find some association and connection with and a bond with that, that they're going through the same thing 
and there's comfort there what do they say misery loves comfort there's comfort in being being attached and bonded to those people that are going through the same things you are there's i believe there's one in every family i believe they're hidden i believe you are hidden in one in every family and sometimes there's two sometimes i hear about oh my mother and my sisters are the same and we have that we have that camaraderie we believe the same thing and and i'm and i'm not envious but i i i i long for that myself i long for to be able to to share that belief that belief in the truth and the restorations of yahuwah with my mother and my sisters and and my children and my niece and my nephew and um and and i pray for that day to come but but just know if you if you're feeling set apart there's a reason you was setting you apart it's part of his purpose it's it, it you you have that in common with with yosef it's part of 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 who you are in in your dna and that yosef's blood is is in you and that is a setting apart but it's also a gathering you've got to know yosef was set apart but his name means he will gather the promise is in his name and therefore it's in your dna most of you belong to yosef if you're part of ephraim you're part of minashe and then even if you're not you're you're identified by ephraim the 10 northern tribes the 10 hidden tribes there's something hidden about you and there's something about you that is is has to do with a, with a double blessing and because Ephraim was doubly blessed, Yosef was doubly blessed. He had Menashe. Uh, Menashe and Ephraim were his children. Menashe means cause to forget. So we're dealing with people who forgot who they were over the hundreds of years, the centuries and the centuries and the centuries and the millennia. They forgot who they were. Okay, so we're calling back. Um, and who is doing it by your spirit? If there's things going on in your spirit that that are not what you learned growing up in the churches, and you grew up in the churches, for instance, most of us did, um, you who has a purpose for whatever you're you're being woken up in the spirit, um, whatever you're seeing that oh I'm learning this, and those people over there are learning it, and those people over there are working the same puzzle, and we're all working this new puzzle. We used to be at that puzzle table. Now we're at this puzzle table. And it's all kind of new and fresh and exciting and scary at the same time. Um, the Father has a purpose. He's gathering. He will gather. That's what Yosef means. It's in it's in your DNA. It's in your heritage. Okay, here we go. In the Hebrew mind, to be in the world but not of it is to be set apart from the world. Moreover, the greater the degree of separation or set apartness, the greater is the reward that accrues. This is because greater set apartness requires greater devotion and an effort to maintain the living sacrifice. These kinds of living sacrifices will be explored more fully in the study covenant relationship. Okay, he has another study, and you can get it and study it when you finish this. I haven't read that one yet, but we're very impressed with what we're reading here. We're very impressed. When set apartness or separation is taken on voluntarily, it carries an enormous blessing. However, Yosef's separation from Israel's family, or, or Yaakov's family, Yasharel, was thrust upon him, and still he served honorably. He didn't choose this for himself, but it was thrust upon him. An immense reward accrued to him because of this. The blessings spoken over Yosef indicate that Yosef would inhabit a land that strongly resembles America with all its manifold blessings. We believe this. Yosef was was Menashe who became America and Ephraim who was was England and all of her territories okay he is going to express it the exact opposite way either way they're both Yosef's kids the Yosef is the the father of both of those tribes by the Elohim of your father who will help you and by the Almighty who will bless you and with blessings and heaven above Blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. These shall be on the head of Yosef and on the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. 
Bereshit in the beginnings, Genesis 49, 22-26. Moshe the prophet also gives Yosef a special blessing for having been consecrated to his task. And of Yosef he said, Blessed of Yahuwah is his land with the precious things of heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of the months, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let this blessing come upon the head of Yosef and upon the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. Deborim or Deuteronomy 33, 13-16. These blessings certainly do seem reminiscent of the land of America, that multicolored, multiracial Protestant land that has been blessed above all others. It also harmonizes with what we know about America being the modern-day representative of the tribe of Ephraim, we believe it's Menashe, serving as the lead tribe of, for the house of Ephraim worldwide. Just consider the United States and England and Australia and New Zealand and part of Canada. <clears throat> um, for more detail, see the upcoming study, Migrations, the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel, we would recommend reading Stephen M. Collins' books on Israel's tribes today, and he's got, that's, that's the fourth, I believe, of his books. At the human level, Yehuda sold Yosef into slavery. At the level of divine providence, however, Ye Yehudah had, Yehuda sent Yosef into Egypt ahead of his brothers so that life could be preserved by means of a great deliverance. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry within, with yourselves because you sold me here. For Elohim sent me before you to preserve life, and Elohim sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Bereshit or Genesis 45, 5 to 7. 5 and 7. Yosef's great deliverance is a prophetic shadow of Yehushua, the blessing that would be given to Yosef's multiracial children so that they could provide for all the people of the world, as well as the Jews and the nation of Yashorael. It also explains why America's Protestant or Ephraimite or Minnesheite Christians are basically the only friends that the modern day state of Israel has. And as galling as the Jews may find the fact, Ephraim will be welcomed home to the land of Israel by a rejoicing, dancing father whose shouts of merriment will be heard above his elder bro son's brothers, uh, elder son's protest, rather. And this is really talking about all ten tribes, not just um, who um, Brother Willis here is saying is, is the United States. It's all ten tribes. We believe that um, Ephraim, again, is, is England and all her territories and all the territories that did belong to her at one time. To extend the analogy further, we can also surmise that Ephraim's sin in leaving the covenant was not altogether his own fault. Ephraim did sin, but Ephraim was also a hybrid child um, and, and was Menashe. His mother, Asenath, was the daughter of the Egyptian high priest, and her Egyptian priestly genetics essentially gave Ephraim's multiracial uh, children, a genetic predisposition to stray from the covenant. So that's genetically predisposed that the Christians would stray from the covenant. Yahuwah allowed Yosef to be sent into Egypt so that he would marry Asenath, thereby ensuring that Ephraim would sin and be spread to the four corners of the earth. This would give all of Adam's fallen children the opportunity to take hold of Yehushua. However, in being spread to the four corners of the earth, Ephraim suffered a continuous backslide, backward slide. In order to stop their backslidden sinning, they needed a renewed covenant to be written on their hearts so that they might once again turn back to Zion. On the one hand, everyone needs salvation in the Messiah, Yehushua, on the other hand, however, the lost and scattered Ephraimites needed Yehushua far more desperately than the Jews did. <clears throat> this is why Yehushua tells us that he was only sent to the house of Ephraim, or Israel, on his first trip, because Yosef's pluralistic children were much more in need of his help. 
and answering Yahushua said, I was not sent at this time. There he's he's using at this time here, um, uh, imposing that in there per his understanding. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Yasharael. And he's saying because of the meaning of a Messiah, that would mean he's sent to bring them back to the covenant. We agree with him on that. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to bring them back to the covenant and to their to bring them to their salvation. We have already seen that the apostles were aware of Ephraim's role in fulfilling scriptural prophecy. It is also clear that the apostles knew the two houses would someday be reunited by what we just saw and how they began their books. Maaseh Acts 1 verse 6, Therefore when they had come together, they asked Yahushua, saying, Master, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Yashareel, or the house of Yashareel? The time to restore the literal kingdom of, to the house of Yashareel was not then at hand. It was only then time for Yahushua's disciples to begin regathering Yosef's children, who had been sent ahead of them to the four corners of the earth. When the descendants of the disciples had found Ephraim's lost and wayward children, they would begin bringing them slowly back into the covenant, generation by generation, by means of Yahushua, the great deliverance. Why the name Christians? We're going to stop here today, and we will carry on there um, next time I read, which will be in a week. Um, I wanted to bring about a couple closing thoughts as uh, da as Daniel twelve four talks about hiding the words and he hide the words seal the book until the time of the end. Um, the words were hidden; they were sealed. The book was sealed until the time of the end. We believe this is the latter days generation that is to open this book and open the words and um, open the book and and open to you the words that were sealed. Uh, we have the codes that have become available since computers have been created. Those things have been greatly documented by the Jewish mathematicians who know the Hebrew language. The codes have been documented. We have the Bible code bombshell that goes through and explains the scientific mathematics of the codes that have been found. We have naysayers. There's always naysayers. Every time you come into any new truth, the enemy will come and try to steal it from you so you don't receive it. He'll try to eat up the seed. He'll try to burn the seed because um, the the roots are, are too shallow. Uh, you'll get you'll get caught up in your in the things of your life, the curses and the blessings, the the things that are coming at you, and and the joys of this life, and and so you won't you won't go deep enough in your in your studies to try to prove these things out. Um, we we also have books that were not included. We have Yashar, which is um, it's like Yashar, like Yasharael, like I say, it's the is the straight path to El. Um, we say Israel, Yisrael, Yasharael, they're all the same. You can repeat it the same way. You can call it any of those names because of the letters that are used. Um, and we can look at the different meanings within the word. Yasharael uh, is the straight path to, to El. It also has to do with prevailing. It also has to do with scattering. Yashar, Yashar, uh, Shara, Shara, uh, Sheen, Resh, Olive has to do with scattering the seeds. Okay, so it makes perfect sense. Yashar is the straight path to El. Those words are both in, within it. Um, let's see, then there's the book of, of Jubilees, with Jubileem. Those are books that were not necessarily readily available, but they are now. There's the book of Enoch, which is written to the latter days. Uh, Hallelujah Scripture sells, I think, all three of these. They're all three within the Sefer, which makes the Sefer a very valuable book. Uh, we recommend listening to Messenger of the Names videos, Restoring the Creator's Name, Hashem Revealed, and What is His Son's Name. These are all about things of restoration that we now have. Uh, another thing I was going to mention that uh, there is there is some understanding, some puzzle pieces being put together 
that this woman that Yosef married was not of Egyptian descent like Norman Willis says. I have not researched it in depth either way, but the sister of the 12 tribes brothers, Dina, she was uh, impregnated uh, in by Shechem. And uh, I believe that's the one. one. One's the father and one's the son. I think Shechem was the son. And the town was called Shechem. And uh, this child was raised as Yehuda's son. And the word says, the word says that when you come in and you live, as a, if, if a Gare comes in and lives among the 12 tribes and does the commandments of Yahuwah, um, they are they have as many rights as as a person that has the DNA. And the thing is is that their child would become would become they would they would basically marry into the twelve tribes. A, a gear would their they would marry into the twelve tribes and then their child would then have the DNA. Okay? So yes, in, in theory if if a if a gear comes in, they have uh DNA that's not of the 12 tribes, but once they have children they're, and they and they're marry into the 12 tribes and their children would have DNA of the 12 tribes, okay? Um, another thing I wanna mention is uh, this teacher, his name is Matthew Nolan, and he teaches at Torah to the Tribes. He has a pretty interesting couple of videos called General, Generational Iniquity, Generational Iniquity and Generational Sin part two, and he does, he talks within these videos about a study that was done, and they had some adulterers, and they had some thieves, and they had some alcoholics, and they tested their DNA, and their DNA had a certain marker on their DNA. Whatever sin that they fell into, their DNA was marked with that sin somehow, and then, and then when they, some of these people repented of their sins and they started living a life serving Yahuwah and and they became righteous people and then their DNA was changed okay and that's about as much as I remember the details of it but the fact that the sin was marked on their DNA and then once people repented of their sins their their DNA changed they had little markers on their DNA that 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 were purified after their repentance and then walking in their repentance of that. So you guys might want to check it out. It's a pretty interesting teaching, generational iniquity. Um, and then the second one is called generational sin part two. I believe that's the way they're, they're marked. So check those things out. Um, we encourage you just to continue restoring the things that you, who is restoring to you receive everything that he's restoring, check it all out. Uh, we have no reason to deceive you. We're just perpetuating what you who is calling us to do, which is to restore the things that were cut off from you that you did not know. Okay. Uh, so we we are we encourage all of you to go and search out the truths of these matters. Take this book very seriously. Take the name of Yahuwah very seriously. Get a restored name scriptures, and wherever you feel the Father calling you out, confirm it in His Word. And then walk in the truth of everything that you restore. There's everything to restore. Genesis or uh, Jeremiah 16, 19 to 21 tells us that everything we inherited is falsehood and vanity. We inherited it from our fathers and that um, there's going to be a restore restoration. He's calling you to the restoration. You can wait until the distress of the Gentiles to do that. Or you could start now, but I would I would highly recommend you to obey the calling that Yahuwah sends your way and research all these matters. If you've heard it, I believe you're responsible to, to search it out. And so I'm going to stay under two hours here. You're definitely welcome, and I hope you have, if you need to, take a break and um, and then continue listening when, when you have opportunity to listen. I know I'm getting tired, so I know that you're getting... You're getting um, saturated as well but take your time go and listen to it again and uh, I ask Yahuwah to water the word of the truth and wash you with the word of his truth and may Yahuwah's may Yahuwah be esteemed in and may you fulfill the calling that he's placed on your life 
and be the, the prophet and the word of truth in your families. And may those come back to the truth through you that you may be used and your, you may reap in a mighty harvest for Yahuwah. In Yahushua's name, I thank him for hearing my prayer for your lives. Amen.